Good afternoon, everyone. I'm Steve Genrich, Associate Vice President for Research at the University of Texas at Dallas for Innovation and Commercialization. And I'd like to welcome you all on behalf of the Office of Research and our Vice President, Joe Pancrazio, today. It's going to be a little unconventional to start with by giving thanks to a number of people that are involved today. First, I want to give thanks to Dresden Goldberg, Suzanne Head, and Enrique Ziller, who are our fantastic production crew that put today's program together. Everything that you see is a credit uh, to their work behind the scenes. Second, very much want to say thank you to our speakers and panelists. Uh, you'll be seeing uh, all of them over the next hour and a half and be introduced to them. So I'll leave that those intros for later. Third, very much want to thank not only the University of Texas at Dallas, research faculty and staff who are on the program today, but also our colleague universities, University of North Texas, University of Texas at Arlington, and Southern Methodist University. Thank you all for joining the program today too. I hope you all will get a chance to speak to them uh, during the breakouts that are at the very end of this session. And then last, but certainly not least, I wanna very much thank all of the public and private representatives from enterprises small companies to large that are on the program today, listening in and participating. This program is for you. Um, uh, the program that you'll hear about over the next hour and a half is for you. And we hope that you take a very enthusiastic and interested role in being a part of this. So without further ado, I wanna introduce you to uh, Tom Bamonte with the North Texas Council of Governments, who's going to kick off today's program. Tom? You are up. Great, thank you, Steve, and thank you, everyone. Um, I work for the North Central Texas Council of Governments, and our job is to plan and program about 150 billion in transportation investment over the next two decades. And what we, we interact with a lot of innovators in the transportation sector, and what we notice is that those innovators come from places where there's strong university support. Uh, so think of Google and Stanford or the automakers in the University of Michigan. And our director, Michael Morris, very inspired by this and suggested that we need to start doing that here in North Texas and build not just a single university, but a network of our four research universities into an R&D network that we could offer to uh, uh, mobility innovators and companies to help bring them to the region, bring their talent, resources, et cetera, to the region. So he went to the uh, our policy board. He got two and a half million dollars in seed money, unanimous support from our policy board to help stand up what's now called the North Texas Center for Mobility Technologies. You're gonna hear a lot about that today. Um, I want, my, my job here is to introduce you to Darren Anderson, who is the Director of Strategy and Innovation at the Texas Department of Transportation. Over the years, I had a chance to interact with Darren in multiple ways. He um, heads the Texas uh, Technology Task Force, the Texas uh, Innovation Alliance, the Governor's Connected and Automated Vehicle Task Force, and that probably gets him from 9 to 9.05 every day because he's working on strategy, planning, research, and a whole host of other activities for TxDOT. So uh, at, we, Darren is going to help frame for us kind of the key opportunities and challenges from the perspective of our State's Department of Transportation to help guide us in where we need to orient the center and hopefully inspire you, both industry and university, for where we may find promising projects that we, COG, can help fund with the seed money. So Darren, I'm gonna turn it over to you and thank you again for joining us. Hey, thanks Tom, and, and that's a very kind introduction to me. Um, look, I'm really happy to be here and I actually, you know, I better understand from Tom's introduction exactly how you guys have formed up and I think it's fantastic and it's really uh, forward thinking and, and a positive um, uh, opportunity for you know the, the whole North Central Texas region and also for the state. So I'm looking forward to this not being the, the last and only time I, I get to come and at least uh, participate and hear what you guys are working on. Um, so really great, great to be here and a great start to, to, to this effort. Um, 
So in my role, I'm somewhat of a futurist in the department. Um, Tom said the first five minutes, but yeah, a lot of my time is actually spent trying to think about this. And, and I actually, you know, want to credit Tom. He spends a lot of time thinking about it as well. And, and I follow him on Twitter and, and get a lot of things that, you know, that I'm like, well, where did you see that? Cause I didn't catch that. And so it's, it's, it's a great uh, partnership that, that I have with him and with the North central Texas as a whole. Um, he asked me to talk about the biggest transportation challenges and opportunities facing TxDOT in the state. And, and I want to, you know, harp on that. It's not just TxDOT. I think of us all as partners in transportation, not only the transportation agencies, but, but the research institutions in the state and private industry and, and what they bring towards advancing mobility and technology uh, in the state. And, and that's really what you guys are focused on as well as the research component. And it's certainly a large part of what I work on at TxDOT. Um, so I'll start by saying welcome to the third decade of the 21st century. I like to point that out often um, and, and get people to realize just how far we are into this century and and, and help you to, to, as we discuss this today, to, to shape your views from that view, you know, from that lens. Um, so I'm asking you for a moment to set aside your experience. Uh, if it's over, older than 20 years, just set aside that experience. And generally that means if you're 30 and over to, to forget anything that, that we did in the 20th century and for a moment, think about what it means in the 21st century and, and not demeaning that experience by any means. But but I think that it's important to remind ourselves, especially as we talk about research and innovation and mobility technology, that, that we look at a lens of what is that going to mean to people that are going to live the remainder of this century, not those that, that came from the previous century. And I'm one of those, so I have to remind myself. Um, so, so challenges that we have, you know, I'll start with Mission Zero, uh, the idea of getting um, fatalities on our, on, I'll say not just our roadways, but our transportation system as a whole down to zero by 2050 is what our commission's goal is. And, and we certainly recognize that we can't do that alone and that there are a number of elements across the state to have to participate in that. To, to make that a reality. And we certainly are striving to do that in TxDOT, but, but there's a lot of opportunity there, both in mobility technologies and research to do that. Another one that doesn't often get touched upon is workforce development and education, both inside our department and other transportation agencies, as, as well as outside. And what are the impacts of all these technologies going to mean in terms of the workforce? What jobs are going to diminish? And then, you know, which is a great concern to many. But then what are all the opportunities and really working together to identify those opportunities and really begin to shape what that means in our in our research universities in terms of developing students in those new fields and making sure that we're preparing them to be effective in the new workforce and, and bring those new skills to to advance transportation and mobility. Uh, so a lot of changing skills, a lot of knowledge management opportunities there. Um, I think it's no surprise that our population in Texas is growing. We just saw the census results reflect that, and it may be even less than, than what that was captured or what was captured in that. Uh, and with that become, comes a lot of residential and economic development that's outpacing mobility development in our state. And, and we have to be cognizant of that. And as I, as I talk about partners in transportation, and as you look at the concept of smart cities, I really think um, we have to re-energize our efforts to bring all parties to the table. It's not just smart mobility, but it's smart government, it's smart land use. And how do we tie all those together as we, as we begin to plan the future of the state, especially in the North Central Texas region? How do we look at the planning we do now and, and make sure that we're working with those people who are honestly just trying to make a living, right? If, if I see a, a burgeoning a group of people coming to the state and they're gonna need housing and they're gonna need office space, I'm doing the best I can to, to build that and make it happen and sell that, but um, want to work with those people to make sure that we're planning effectively so that mobility solutions are tied into that in a, in a very effective and, and positive way for the quality of life of our people. Um, so that's certainly on the minds of TxDOT. Uh, transportation and mobility then, as I said, is in a more integrated system of systems. It's no longer a standalone siloed approach in my eyes. And that's something that we all need to work together to, to realize um, and break down those government and private industry and research silos as well. Um, a part of that's going to be predicting the changing landscape of lifestyle choices in the 21st century, you know, now post COVID or hopefully post COVID. 
and what that impact on mobility means in terms of people's needs. You know, there's a lot of talk about, you know, more work from home, but what does that mean and how might that reshape what happens downtown versus in the surrounding areas? And, and we certainly have seen a growth of, of delivery capabilities to people's houses. And so will the mobility traffic change and what are going to be those mobility needs as we continue to grow our population and where will the mobility needs happen? Um, so certainly we, you know, we're all aware of the growth of potential autonomous vehicle options, uh, certainly a growth in transportation uh, freight related, uh, both at the long range level, but also at the, the local delivery level and the beginnings of uh, autonomous vehicles in the passenger market. Although, you know, there's still a lot of consolidation happening. We just learned about Lyft and Toyota, um, you know, Lyft selling its autonomous vehicle operations to Toyota. And, and, and some of that consolidation is happening broadly across the passenger market. So we'll keep our eyes on that, but but there will be impacts from those that happen across the state. Um, we certainly support connectivity and, and development of connected vehicle technologies and, and are looking for a number of opportunities there to, to grow that beyond just the beginnings of pilots in the state to a much larger aspect statewide. Um, and then any feasible city and roadway redesign that, that might be related to those, not only in autonomous vehicles, but, but multimodal, you know, the, the advent of scooters, the the impact of, of smaller, you know, bicycles and, and uh, mopeds and all, you know, what are all those going to mean and how can we feasibly redesign our, our downtown or our city roadways as a part of that? Um, big uh, interest in supporting the physical and digital infrastructure and what that means, the development of digital twinning solutions, uh, data management challenges and, and where will data tr reside as it relates to connectivity and towards getting more and more information to those people and their modal choices and not just in passenger vehicles, but, but widespread and inclusive of pedestrians as well. Um, a part of that means power resources and how do you bring power into the system that enables all of that digital infrastructure? And how do you also look at things like electrification or hydrogen vehicles and, and what will, what, what will that mean in terms of the overall transportation system and where those might be, in play if it's on system itself. Um, certainly there's always a balance of regulation uh, as a part of that versus innovation. And we have to work to, you know, make sure that at our local level that those I, you know, needs are being identified and they make it up uh, all the way to the state level in our legislative sessions to ensure that, that we're being flexible enough in our, in our laws and our regulations to allow for that innovation in preparing us for, you know, the advent of newer mobility solutions. Um, I think that there'll be challenges in advanced mobility management, uh, certainly ground and air, uh, as it relates to auto, you know, unmanned aerial systems and urban air mobility. And we have to look at how that's gonna play into the larger mobility solution and the ground solution. And there'll be a mix of autonomous and human operated systems for I believe decades to come and how we might better manage that overall in our city and our regional landscapes is important. Um, certainly resources keeping pace with demand. We've seen just in time um, become a challenge during COVID and, and now people are you know, looking at how do we stock better and prepare for that. Certainly there's a, a, a challenge in certain raw materials. We certainly see in chip manufacturing lately that that's affecting the auto industry. And, and so we're gonna have challenges there that, that will affect some of our planning and we have to be prepared for them. And in the bigger picture, the ability to uh, align state resources to de you know, developing demands for multimodal solutions, I think will be on the table as we go into the next decade or so. Um, a couple other ideas becoming as fast as the, as the citizenry and as digital as the citizenry is a challenge for government, but it's not just at the state level, it's all levels. And we have to look at you know, how we apply resources to that and adapt our laws to that and just make ourselves more adaptable. Um, leave you with a couple of thoughts. Businessinsider.com had an article um, just recently, I think it was in March, um, about 10 cities, 10 US cities that it identified as paving the way for the future investing in technology and sustainability and infrastructure. Now there was only one Texas city on that. And honestly, I was a little surprised at the one they chose I would have probably leaned towards Dallas, Fort Worth, Houston, or Austin, but they selected San Antonio and they named their Office of Innovation, their efforts in digital infrastructure and manufacturing technologies a part of that. 
But I believe all our Texas cities should have been on that list. And so I challenge you to, to, to make that top 10 list the next time they develop one um, and, and make sure that we're all leaning forward in, in developing a, a more comprehensive capability in the state. Uh, mm -hmm. Two things I really didn't hit on, but I, you know, I don't want to you know, miss those. Resiliency is a growing challenge. Uh, we certainly are aware of flooding in our state. We're aware of uh, ice challenges more uh, pertinently now. Um, and there will be continued um, emphasis on that from the federal level on down on uh, being resilient at the physical as well as the environmental and cybersecurity levels. Um, and also we need to do a much better job, I think, broadly in public involvement, education, perception and feedback and get a greater citizen focus on how we uh, improve our communications, our planning and engage multiple citizen groups in the development of the future of mobility and what it means at the city and regional level as well as the state level. Uh, so all of those, I think, is a quick rundown of challenges. I went a little over and I apologize for that, but you know, I'm, I'm going to be on the panel and I'm happy to hit on some more of these as it relates to research opportunities and, and technology development as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Darren. Um, it, it, an impossible job to describe the variety of uh, opportunities and challenges in 10 minutes. Uh, so um, thank goodness you'll spend some more time with us at the end. I'm going to move on to uh, Victor Fishman and Dr. John Hansen from UT Dallas to speak about the organization NTCMT and the uh, funding opportunities for universities and corporate partners together. So uh, take it away, Victor and John. Much appreciated. Thank you so much. Uh, we're very, very happy to be here with you this afternoon and to share uh, insights about the North Central Texas for the North Texas Center for Mobility Technologies. Uh, certainly appreciate that. And uh, John and I are gonna share the duties now in, uh, in terms of uh, the, the opportunity. So the, the Mobility Center is a program of the Texas Research Alliance. And the next slide will tell you just a little bit about the Texas Research Alliance. What we're really saying here is that Texas Research Alliance is designed to bring municipalities, companies, public agencies into research and innovation partnerships with our universities to solve the problems that they have and to build a capability within our universities. And so you see that actually fits right in with what we're gonna talk about in terms of the Mobility Center. Now the next slide will take us to uh, the Mobility Center. <clears throat> and we've got uh, the website there. Uh, www.tradfw.org slash NTCMT. Let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> what we want to grow into is to be everyone in the community's first call for mobility solutions and systems, okay? And we're going to bring the coordinated expertise of all of our universities to all of those problems. And we've made it very easy for you to reach out to all of our universities in one interaction. And we'll talk a little bit about that uh, coming up. So the next slide. <clears throat> These are the objectives that we've set for ourselves. And you can see that they're, they're reasonably large. And so we wanna have this network that all of our companies, municipalities and public agencies and nonprofits can use for mobility solutions. We want this network to attract talent to Dallas, Fort Worth and all of North Texas. Okay. Capability development within the universities. Our universities have committed to stepping up and building capability at the faculty and the facility level as the demand requires. We also want to be sure that partnerships and transporta transportation related, related projects are something that we can easily facilitate and make that much easier for you than it has been in the past through a central clearinghouse, the North Texas Center for Mobility Technologies. And essentially, we also want to do, as uh, Darren mentioned, focus on workforce enhancement. And uh, we'll be working that with you through opportunities for internships, opportunities for uh, talent development within the universities as well. Okay. On the next slide, we'll talk a little bit about the stakeholders here. And we've talked about this. We've got NCT COG, who is really the driving force 
behind this. And uh, Michael Morris and Tom Bamonte and the team have really set this up in a way that will generate value for the community across the, the stakeholders. So we have all of our industry, all of our companies, our municipalities, small and large, all of our universities, University of Texas at Arlington, the University of Texas at Dallas, the University of North Texas and Southern Methodist University. Now, one of the things you see here is that all of the universities are, are guided by a memorandum of agreement between the Texas Research Alliance and the universities. And that allows each of the universities to engage with a company partner, with a public agency, or with a municipality in behalf of all of the other universities. So once you have that engagement with that one university, you're going to be able to work with all of them. And that sets up a very efficient way to partner with our universities. Now, the next slide talks a little bit about our structure and you'll see why this is an important thing for us. We have a leadership committee and the role of the leadership committee is to ensure that we promote and accept important and timely projects for mobility technologies. Okay? And we have members on our, um, our leadership committee that represent all of the aspects associated with mobility. Okay? We have our university members. We, each university has a member on the leadership committee and that will guide us in terms of the technology development, the lead university that can interact with our sponsors to make it so much easier for you and the universities to partner. Now, here's something I wanna to mention to you in particular, the technical advisory committee. Although I've gotten some feedback that I should call this the technical advisory group because it's gonna be pretty large in terms of membership. We want the technical advisory committee or group to be the place that surfaces topics to the leadership committee that the mobility center should focus on. So if you belong to the, uh, the technical advisory committee or the technical advisory group, okay, you're gonna have the opportunity to say, I think the region should work on these topics. And those topics will be important when we have a call for proposals uh, to, for the general community. Okay? So I want you all to go to the website and there is the website on that bullet uh, for the Mobility Center. And it'll take you five minutes to join the Technical Advisory Committee. Okay. So let's go to the next site, slide. These are, are the members of our leadership committee now. So Steve Gingrich, Associate VP for Innovation and Commercialization, University of Texas at Dallas. Professor Gautam Das, Associate Dean for Research, School of Engineering. The University of Texas at Arlington. Professor Andre Vovedin, Associate Dean for Research, School of Engineering at UNT. And Professor Khaled Abdelhani, Civil and Environmental Engineering at Southern Methodist University. Tom Bamonte, Senior Program Manager of Automated Vehicles at NCT COG. Mr. Michael Rogers, the Deputy City Manager at the City of Glen Heights. Ms. Alicia Winkleblesh, the Senior Strategic Initiatives Officer at the City of Arlington. Mr. Chad Sparks, the Director of Strategic Campaigns and Business Development at Bell Flight, and Ms. Jing Zhu, Interim Vice President of Service Planning and Development at DART. So we've got all of our mobility and transportation environments and uh, capabilities covered here in our leadership committee. So the next slide. This is our overall process. So we've made it as easy as possible for you to work with us, the Mobility Center, and the university. So proposal, proposal submissions through the website. That proposal goes to the leadership committee for project acceptance and prioritization, okay? Once you have a project that's accepted, then you will be notified by the Mobility Center, and that will probably be me, be me who says, your project has been accepted, the lead university will be either the university you were working with to put that project together, or one that we have determined among the universities in the Mobility Center has the greatest capability to be helpful to you. Then you interacting with the universities will develop a sponsored research agreement for that project, okay? That project then will go to execution with the relationship between you and the university in order to execute that project. Now, one of the key metrics that we're gonna follow is how often do you do this? So if your experience is really good as you go through that process, 
We believe you'll continue to do that time and time again and build very strong and lasting relationships with faculty, hire students that come out of those programs and continue to grow and solve your mobility problems. Now let's go to the next slide. <clears throat> okay, and this is where John is going to take over. Now John Hansen is the Associate Dean for Research in the Johnson School of Engineering and Computer Science at UT Dallas. John and I are longtime friends and I'm very happy to have him as a partner here today. John. Victor, thank you very much. Uh, I think you got cut off, at least from the audio on the last clip there, but uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to speak with uh, all the attendees here for, uh, for this center. So uh, my role here as Associate Dean for Research at UT Dallas is to help facilitate, uh, obviously, faculty research. Uh, here, what we're trying to do is to emphasize that this is a broad-based uh, consortium that includes uh, all four major universities in the Dallas Metroplex region. Uh, working in partnership to try and advance uh, mobility and, and transportation aspects here. So my goal here in the next uh, two or three slides is to kind of talk a little bit about how you might submit a proposal to uh, the CMT and how you might follow and engage with the universities in order to facilitate that. So first, uh, the proposals themselves, all the major objectives uh, for the center is to obviously support mobility, tech, uh, mobility technology and system challenges these should be focused on both uh, companies, municipalities, any general agency that might benefit from an advancement in mobility. And these partnerships uh, are, are to be established with uh, the, one of the four major research universities or a combination of those universities. Uh, UT Dallas is one, uh, University of Texas at Arlington, second, University of North Texas, and Southern Methodist University. So all four universities, we actually have been collaborating, working very strongly uh, with uh, the Texas Research Alliance for more than maybe two years now uh, in looking at transportation, a variety of other topics. So we're well versed in kind of partnering with, with uh, the TRA. So in the submissions process, as uh, Victor noted, you would uh, go directly to this website. You can see the uh, link is, is uh, listed here. Uh, you would typically be either a company, a municipality, or public agency uh, who would be submitting the proposal. And then uh, what we would encourage you to do is also to look a little bit at the proposal funding criteria before you submit your proposal so you have an understanding of the process here. Uh, if we go to the next slide, please. So there's three different ways that one could submit a proposal. So the first option is that you can just submit directly uh, to the website, and here any company, nonprofit, or municipality can do this. Uh, you go directly to uh, the NT's CMT, uh, submit at any time. The uh, leadership team reviews uh, proposals on a quarterly basis, and if you have not identified uh, a university partner, the leadership team will assess your needs and uh, look over the four universities and identify maybe one university, it might be a suggested lead uh, university to partner with. So that's the option number one. Option number two, you can directly partner with the university, reach out, maybe talking with a particular faculty member or group of faculty members at one of the four schools, develop maybe your project research ideas, and then working with the university faculty, uh, look at the scope of the work, what you're trying to accomplish, and include that in the proposal. Uh, in addition to that, uh, the Texas Research Alliance will be available if you're looking to try and uh, get additional support or engagement with some of the other schools. Uh, there are additional uh, startup funds that are also available uh, if you are looking at uh, startup companies trying to uh, get your foot in the door or to advance in the technology and mobility space. Uh, nonprofits, municipalities, and public agencies are all encouraged to develop uh, project proposals with the universities. We can go to the next uh, slide. The third option is uh, to uh, respond to the call for, for projects. So we typically will have uh, two calls, one in March and one in September. And the calls uh, will be open, allow you to submit your proposals. Again, any company, nonprofit, municipality, or public agency can respond. And uh, we'll, we'll submit directly to, uh, to the website. Uh, to give you just a sense of the funding process here, Typically, uh, a quarter of the uh, funds for the project would typically be supported 
by the university, that's the host university. Uh, the NTC COG will provide matching support also at 25%, and the sponsor would be providing uh, the final 50%. So that's, a, that's how things are kind of partitioned up. For uh, the project, the next call will take place here in September uh, 2021. Uh, and I'd also note, at least for those that have an interest in engaging with the University of Texas at Dallas, uh, our Office of Research has provided additional uh, seed monies uh, of up to $5,000 per project for five different faculty uh, to engage and defray some of the costs and developing the proposal with their partners. So that might involve some planning, uh, many workshops if you're looking to try and, and partner with someone from our university. Now, last uh, slide I'd like to show, if you can move to the next one. Uh, when we mention research, a lot of times when you talk to a faculty member, they have one idea. If you talk to maybe someone in a startup company, they have a different idea. If you talk to someone that uh, maybe a larger uh, corporate organization, they may have a research branch, which is different. So. We use this uh, technology readiness level uh, to kind of identify the regions where uh, proposals would typically be expected. So uh, in these early levels, uh, levels, two other levels, one to three, these are much more basic research and maybe some of the federal agencies might be su uh, supporting those. Uh, the hope is that many of the universities would already have level uh, TRL levels one to three support maybe from a federal agency that might leverage uh, engagements with the companies. If you're looking at, let's say, the higher levels, uh, TRL level seven to nine, these are much more applied and looking at more direct uh, deployment uh, of solutions. So the focus here would primarily be in these middle regions, uh, level four to six, where it involves some type of research, but also potentially some development aspects here. And that's where the university partners would be engaged with uh, both companies and municipalities in developing an integrated solution that will hopefully advance uh, and uh, project the next generation of mobility and transportation infrastructure. So I think I'll pause there and move and pass the baton back to uh, to Victor. I think uh, you'll move on to the next one. Yes, John, absolutely. Thank you very much. I uh, appreciate that. Dresden, if we could have the next slide. <clears throat> So John talked a little bit about the, the funding criteria here, okay? And I think uh, you, you're appreciative of that, okay? You'll be able to find that on the website as well. Let's go to the next slide, okay? So we're, we're, I just want to be sure that you appreciate that we're interested in projects of varying sizes in all areas of mobility and technology systems with periods of performance of up to 24 months. Okay, John had mentioned that NCT COG will match fund 25% in cash. The universities will match funds 25% uh, in kind, <clears throat> and the sponsor pays the, the remainder, okay? And one of the things that uh, you should appreciate is that TRA will have a task on all projects, 3% uh, of the budget, that will help us continue to move the mobility center forward. And uh, other than that, the last slide will take us to uh, uh, the uh, contact information, okay? Uh, it, we clearly are a community-driven approach supporting mobility, talent, and research needs in Dallas-Fort Worth. And here's our contact information. I'm looking forward to working with you, and I hope you'll reach out to me whenever the need arises. I'm happy to interact. And with that, I'd like to begin to introduce our panel. <clears throat> So Dresden, we can bring up our panel. Thank you. Jing Zhu from Dart. Okay, Lainey Cloud from Via. Rock Robinson from uh, eCara. Uh, Darren Anderson from uh, TechStot. And Michael Rogers from Glen Heights. Thank you very much for being with us here. I'm very, very pleased uh, to be with you here today. And we're certainly looking forward to, uh, to the panel. Okay, we uh, all of our panelists are leaders in their field and they share their roles, insights, and needs in mobility and transportation. Since university research partnerships are central to the mobility center support for your proposals, a representative from one of mobility center's four research universities will be in each breakout room. These university representatives can also serve on also serve on the mobility center's leadership committee. Now, given that we only have thirty minutes for the panel. 
you'll be able to follow up with all of our panelists and our, our university uh, leadership in our breakout sessions, okay? I'll call on each of the panelists, asking them to introduce themselves and share their interests in mobility and what they might be looking forward to going, look, looking to going forward. I'm gonna start with Darren, since you gave us a, a wonderful introduction to TechSnot. So Darren, thanks so much for your earlier presentation. Uh, <clears throat> do you have any additional comments that you'd like to make at this time? So I, I went a little over, so I'll cede back my time, but I just, I'd say we, uh, we do have a research program um, annually, and, uh, and those awards will actually be going out very soon for the next fiscal year. But um, that's a regular program, but we also have a number of uh, other elements in the, in the state that we, we work through, and Tom mentioned some of those, and I want to talk about those more. And then I'd just say all those areas I covered were um, ones that are, are potential areas for development that would, I think, greatly help mobility across the state, and I'll cede my time. Uh, Darren, thank you so much, and I couldn't agree with you more. Every one of those areas will be important for not only uh, our university, but all of our community. Uh, Jing Zhu, uh, you have significant background experience in transportation and, and mobility, uh, and uh, you were, your role, at, you were, you're in your role as an interim assistant vice president for planning and development at DART. Would you tell us what that means at DART? and share thoughts thoughts on DART's GoLink program and DART's efforts in electric buses and autonomous buses. Yeah, absolutely. Thank you, Victor, and good afternoon, everyone. Uh, my name is Jing Xu. I am the interim assistant vice president for uh, DART service planning and development. So for anyone kind of leave work or um, uh, study in in the Dallas area, you must be familiar with the Dallas area rapid transit DART. So we're the mobility service provider for um, North Texas and our service area covers 700 square miles in Dallas and 12 surrounding cities. So we offer a series of uh, uh, mobility services, including uh, bus, light rail, commuter rail, paratransit, microtransit, um, site-specific shuttles, van pools. And in fact, um, our bus route A83, which serves the, actively serves the UTE campus, is one of our head, highest ridden routes in our bus system. So, and DART has been always been valued the connection with our uh, research um, institutions. Um, like we worked together with faculties, researchers, students, you know, at UTD, SMU, UT Arlington, we helped um, you know, answer questions or hire employees from uh, those graduates. And we're um, actually interviewing two interns from the uh, UT system for the summer as well. Um, so the two specific areas Victor just mentioned, I think um, uh, I'm going to touch a little bit over here and then going to the breaking room, we can uh, focus on it a little bit even a little bit more is, um, you know, darts, insights in the mobility um, definitely focus on innovation, feasibility, and technologies. So uh, the GoLink program is one of the recent services that adopts to enhance the first last mile connection as well as the cost effectiveness um, alternative to fixed route services at low density areas. So our GoLink program was built upon a federal mobility on demand sandbox grant back in uh, 2016. Uh, we were among one of the 11 um, winners of this federal grants in 2016. And with years of involvement, uh, DART schooling program has expanded to 16 zones in DART service areas. And within each zone, the customer can book a trip connecting to the real station or travel any point to point within the zone. So the service is on demand. Um, you can book a trip through Dart's Go Pass app, and the average waiting time for uh, for vehicles to get to your door is uh, just about ten minutes. Um, and for each zone, the Golink service also have dedicated wheelchair accessible provider as well as Uber Pool as a supplemental provider. And the, our Golink service has been very popular and highly rated by our customers. So during pre-pandemic times, it covers about uh, 1,000 riders a day. And during the pandemic, it drops to about 400 riders a day. But it shows a great potential to move up and continue to grow. We, we definitely see the ridership begin to um, edging up um, at this moment. 
Um, also, uh, you may be aware Dart is also going through a complete uh, brand new bus network redesign right now. And under this proposed new bus network, which will be implemented in January 2022, um, the Dart Golding zones will be nearly doubled. So that's about uh, Dart Go Link. And I also want to touch a little bit on um, um, Dart's initiative relates to electronic vehicles and autonomous vehicles. So uh, these are more like uh, um, in an exploration stage at Dart. Um, speaking of the electric vehicles, DART is an environmentally responsible agency. Our bus fleets has been 100% compressed nature gas CNG um, to reduce air emission. We also have a, a small fleet of electric buses currently deployed at two bus routes. Uh, one is 749, which serves downtown Dallas Convention Center to the Southwest Medical District. And the other one is 52, which serves the West Dallas areas along the Singleton Boulevard. So we also have been constantly looking for expanding our electric bus fleets you know, with the battery and technologies continues to advance in these areas, especially when we can uh, leverage federal grants such as the FTA LONO grants. Uh, we're currently working on a couple of applications, in fact. Um, we also have identified several additional electronic bus routes under the new bus network to be implemented in January 2022. Um, in fact, we are also actively considering a few site pilots for electric shuttles, such as the DFW International Airport area, as well as the Collin County Mo Collin Creek Mall in the in the Plano. So those are both under active discussion at this moment. And speaking of the autonomous bus, um, so DART is actively monitoring the technology advancements and exploring the options. So DART has partners with AECOM and 12 other progressive transit agencies in the country to form the autonomous bus consortium, which we call ABC. Um, the goal of the ABC is to celebrate the development of autonomous transit bus technology by combining the resources and creating a mature market for its use when the right opportunity comes. So DART has tentatively selected the um, Love Link routes, which serves the um, Love Field airports. Um, as a potential pilot project locations. So this route is a kind of a four miles loop route and also operates on relatively um, street roads and anchored at the Inwood Lovefield station. Uh, the next logic step of this effort is kind of do all the risk assessments, uh, testing the evaluation, um, if the DART board approves us to move forward, we will be able to um, have all the prep work ready from there. Um, and speaking of the challenges of the uh, AV uh, technologies, it uh, mainly relates to the public acceptance to um, the technology and to the uh, implementation. Also, we need to have the operator to get specific trainings for this type of services. That also relates to infrastructure planning, um, as well as additional fundings to sustain um, the implementation for this kind of services. So that's my quick updates about um, DART's insights in uh, innovation, flexibility, and technology. And I will be um, Excited to meet you at the break room to answer additional questions. Jean, thank you so much. I uh, very much appreciate that. Uh, Michael, you're currently the deputy city manager at Glen Heights and formerly the director of transportation for the city of Dallas. Glen Heights spans two counties and is growing and is a growing municipality. Uh, your thoughts? There, let me. There we go. We unmuted that mic there. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, yes, as, as Victor just said, um, there are a lot of, of similarities, but a lot of differences between the large cities. And I've worked in Dallas and I've worked in um, um, San Antonio, and now I'm with a smaller city on Heights. A lot of differences, but there's some similarities as well. And that's what I want to talk about 
is some of those similarities that we um, have in each and every one of those communities. In each and every one of those communities, I've seen one of the bigger issues that we face within our community is access to mobility options. And so this is a challenge for so many people, whether it's urban, whether it's rural. And, and when I talk about access to mobility options, I want to say, OK, you just heard about DART and, and that system. Well, guess what? Not everybody's close enough to the public transportation system to be able to get to it. Well, what about some other mobility options? And I know this may, may seem hard to believe for a lot of people, but not everybody has an automobile. But even those who do have an automobile, think about this scenario. You have a household of three, mother, father, and a, a, a teenage child. They all have jobs. There's only one car in that household. Guess what? There are some mobility challenges that are going to be taking place because you may have three people that are working and there's only one vehicle that's there. This is where what I'm talking about uh, access to mobility options. And this is where we need to work to try to have as many options as possible because it's so important for our economy to get to jobs, to get to uh, doctor's appointments, to just to pick up food, to have those options ready and available to, to all citizens. So, how can we try to equalize some of these issues that we're experiencing, whether it's rural or urban? Well, technology. I think technology is something, and you just heard it, technology is something that really can help to solve some of these problems. And I love technology, but I don't, from a municipal standpoint, I don't think any of us wanna just do technology for technology's sake. But what we want to do is start to look at how can these, these technologies start to solve the problems that our citizens are experiencing within our communities. And that's where this, this technology and the research that is being taken place can really start to make that mark, especially if you want to do things with the municipal uh, levels. And I think there's some great technologies that's starting to really address these problems. You just heard it. Mobility on demand. Think about that. Now we have that access to get to all of these places that are necessary. That's something that we have to start looking at, um, especially in the rural areas, because in the rural areas, we don't necessarily have a public transportation system or a viable public transportation system in many of those areas. Other technologies that are so important that can start to solve problems for us, think about drones or think about autonomous robots and those items starting to deliver things to people within their community. And I want to give you an example of why this is important. Every one of us, or some of, well, every one of us has probably been in a hospital at some point. Think about when you get out of that hospital. Generally, that doctor is prescribing some type of medication. Now you're coming from the hospital and you're going home and do you really want to stop at the, uh, at the pharmacy? No, you really don't. But think about that autonomous robot delivering your medication right to your house. That's the type of things that we can start to really look at, start to partner with our communities because these things are vital and they solve these problems that may seem very simple to a lot of people, but these are, these are issues that really have an, a negative effect on people's quality of life. So, my advice for any of those who really want to work with the municipal governments out here is really looking at how can we start to solve problems, whether it's dealing with access to mobility or dealing with ways in which we could start to alleviate some of the congestion, looking at ways in which we could start to ensure we have better air quality. Uh, so many different things that, or from a safety standpoint, but when we start to work together, and this is going to be so important, and, and Darren talked about this as well, from the municipal standpoint, we also have to start looking at our comprehensive land use plans and working together to start 
making sure that we do um, start developing in areas in which they do have transportation and transportation hubs, because now from a workforce development standpoint, these mobility access issues start to go away. So for those who are looking to work in the municipal realm, think about the issues that our community has and how can we partner together to try to solve a problem. Thank you. Thank you so much. Much appreciate uh, the insight and the contribution. And uh, what I'd like to do next is to introduce Lainey Cloud. So Lainey, uh, you're the VIA Transportation Partnership Manager for the Central U.S. You cover a lot of territory, Lainey. Uh, you have some outstanding projects and relationships in Texas and especially in DFW. Would you tell us what VIA does, the core contribution VIA makes to on-demand mobility, and what in a perfect world VIA would like to do next? Yeah, absolutely. Thank you so much, Victor. Um, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Lainey Cloud. Um, as, as Victor mentioned, I oversee the central region for VIA. Um, based in San Antonio, so um, I spend quite a quite a bit of time with our, our Texas partners, of course. Um, I work with cities, agencies, operators, university systems, um, essentially any providing transportation services or generally interested in mobility um, and I work to establish both new partnerships um, to solve a variety of mobility challenges but also work very closely with our existing partners um, once we've established some kind of partnership um, and continue to kind of grow and optimize their their existing services um, so for those of you that are a, a bit unfamiliar with VIA, um, we're a technology uh, mobility company um, that really aims to serve um, as an end-to-end -end solution, um, you know, in optimizing transit systems. Um, quite broad, um, but I'll, I'll dig in. So we work with over 200 partners um, and we're now in 24 countries um, globally. So we work with both big and small cities, um, urban, suburban, rural cities. Um, and, and within each of those communities, we're using on-demand transit to solve a, a variety of different mobility challenges um, and, and use cases. So, for example, some of our services are looking at complementing the existing networks by feeding into them in some way or providing, you know, direct first and last mile connections. Some services, um, you know, where we're focusing on upgrading legacy paratransit systems or even integrating um, you know, paratransit systems and on-demand services into one kind of commingled comprehensive service. Um, in some cases, was, we're actually completely replacing hyper underperforming fixed routes um, or bringing service to transit deserts where maybe there, there was no service before. Um, and even, you know, in some cases, powering fleets of school buses um, to, to get kids K through 12 uh, to school every day. Uh, we also recently acquired a company called Remix. Um, which is a collaborative mapping and planning tool some of you might be familiar with. Um, and it really, again, kind of supports our initiative to provide this end-to-end -end or A to Z solution to our partners. So um, whether our partners are on the side of the spectrum of you know, planning and scheduling and just kind of have an idea or a concept um, all the way into the actual you know, point of operations and, and putting wheels on the ground, um, VIA is there, is there to support. Um, so specifically in Texas, um, you know, as Victor mentioned, we have amazing partners in Arlington, um, Fort Worth and with Trinity Metro, Denton County with DCTA, Tyler Transit in, in Tyler, Texas, Cat Metro and Carts in, in more of the central Texas region. Um, and we're really grateful for the opportunity to work with, you know, such innovative partners and, and we're excited by uh, the work that we're doing. So, um, you know, we're, we're interested in continuing to explore a variety of, of innovative initiatives, whether it's thinking about, you know, integrating EVs and AVs into our broader service, um, such as what we're doing in Arlington with uh, the RAPID project um, on UTA's campus um, and, and our hybrid vehicles. Um, replacing underperformance or, or network-wide even, um, such as what we're doing in DCTA, um, or providing kind of multimodal and, and trip planning connections, um, as in what we do with, with Fort Worth with Trinity Metro, and just kind of thinking about deepening our integration into Dart's GoPass app um, for kind of, you know, broader regional connectivity. 
Um, we're always looking ways, you know, to kind of optimize existing services and, and provide better services to the communities that our partners serve um, and just think about ways to, to innovate and, and try new things. So um, thank you again for, for having this and I'm excited to, to talk more in the breakouts. Lainey, thank you so much. Much appreciated. Uh, Rock, you're, uh, we're very fortunate in the sense that my understanding from uh, a little bit of psychology that I've had is that people remember the first and the last better than anything else in the middle. So uh, this is your opportunity. You're an entrepreneur of many talents. And with your startup, Ikara, you're focused on reducing global carbon emissions one ride at a time. Uh, tell us about Ikara, how a partnership with universities for grant funding will help you and help all of us. Rock, go for it. Yeah, thanks for having me and I uh, really appreciate your time. What our company does is we basically are Uber, uh, but much better for everyone. We use all electric vehicles uh, because we want to focus on the health and safety of not just the passenger, but the drivers in the community. So uh, we use these electric vehicles to, one, uh, to create an awareness for the public because we want to help the public kind of help, you know, convert from gas to electric cars. So 97% of the people that ride with us have never been in an electric car before. What we've realized is that 95% of those people say that all things considering after riding an electric car that they would buy one in the future. So we feel like we kind of represent this awareness piece for community to help transition people to electric vehicles. Secondly, um, we want to become, when I say we, we want to build tools to anchor uh, infrastructure, charging, for example. Uh, we know that if we can figure out how to increase utilization with electric cars, then, you know, uh, infrastructure would kind of naturally organically happen. So we're trying to beat that down, like really create this utilization all the time and, 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 and really have a sustainable business model. So we don't, uh, we share assets. So we know that these electric vehicles are long-term assets. So we tend to share them and um, that's kind of what we do, but our partnership with uh, UTD right now is really cool. We have opportunity to partner with uh, Professor David Larry over at UTD and um, he's been working with air quality for quite some time. We started working with air quality probably about two years ago. And um, as we, you know, put this partnership together, it's been amazing. And his uh, studies have really advanced us about five years as it pertains to air quality. Um, I'll show you real, I'll show you a, a real short clip of some really interesting data that we've been able to capture. Uh, we put together some hardware and software that actually harvests real-time air quality as these cars are driving down the road making revenue. And um, we've basically, as you can see, kind of built this interface to show where this car is tracking air quality throughout this uh, little journey here. And you can kind of see these spikes in air quality or, uh, throughout the city. And at, at scale, what we're trying to do is figure out where some of these bad sources are and how we change that. And then how we further uh, just deepen the value on what we're doing as far as using electric vehicles and, and um, emissions-free uh, solutions. So uh, love this partnership with uh, UTD is helping us tremendously. And uh, hopefully we have some really cool information and data to share with everyone as time goes goes on. So thank you. Rock, thank you very, very much. And thank you to all of our panelists. I, I've learned a great deal and I very much appreciate your participation today. I'm gonna to turn it back over to uh, our host, Steve G at UT Dallas. Steve, thank you so much. I echo your comment, Victor. Thanks to everyone for speaking. You actually now, have an opportunity to speak directly with those panelists. So if you would, at this point, we're wrapping up the formal group comments, go to these breakout rooms, choose one where you either can speak with Darren or Jingyu or uh, Michael. And finally, we have the industry one with, with Rock and uh, Lainey. Uh, hope to see you at one of those uh, breakouts. We'll do that for the next 30 minutes or so. We have time allotted to have those conversations and we'll see you shortly. Thank you.